left, it says creamy broccoli soup. Now, creamy, but is there cream? No. And that's the part of the beauty of the soup. I think you'll find it delightful, as I do, either in a hot preparation or cool or chill on a summer's day. It's nice to have in the refrigerator, and believe it or not, I'm not a cold soup person. This stuff is tasty and easy and nutritious. It's important to kind of think about how do you get crunchy veg in your diet if you don't like crunchy veg? Uh, that's kind of hard sometimes. This makes it possible to get some crunchy veg in your in your meal plan, and you don't even have to chew too hard if, if that's a, if that's your um, I guess your background in, in food and how you want to eat your food during the day. So what do I say here? What we want to start off with is a bunch of broccoli. Now I at home already pre-chopped this broccoli for you folks because. Well, because it was easier, and I don't think you wanted to hear the food processor whizzing about you and hurting your ear or drums. But before we start with that broccoli, I want to talk about water saute. I'll frequently advertise that a lot of you know me through the Wednesday night dinners at Opera Plaza at 6 p.m. Every week it's hosted. The vegan dinner, all you can eat, and guess what? There's no cooking with oil. I often get people come up to me and say, oh, how can it? How can it be? How can you cook with no oil? Well, I'm going to show you here today, and it's an awesome way to help boost up your health. And depending upon your nutrition needs, some of us, you know, the oil just kind of clogs us up. Not always in our best interest nutritionally or health speaking. So here's how you do it. You get a pan, any kind of pan. This is like my demo pan. It's kind of like my nicest one, but it's still, because you use a good scrubbing on the bottom, it's clean inside. So we're going to put this here on the pan to start with. You can hear it starting to click. And now what I'm going to do is get my my onion, and my onion I've just rough chopped it. You know it's easy to do that on a cutting board. Not, you don't need to be handle it with finesse because we're going to puree it later. And we're just going to drop this in here as the directions say. Just put it in your pan, and then you're just going to need a little bit of water to start it off with. I think I say here I need I'm asking for a half cup of water. And what you want to do is to ensure that you're not boiling the onion. Um, you know, it'll, what happens is, is that the vegetables become soggy if you boil it in the water that's not very hot. Ideally, I should have had my water a little hotter, so I'm telling you the exact opposite. This should come back up to temp. It's just a little bit of water in the pan. I'm tilting it so you don't really see it. You just want a little bit of buffer in there between the vegetable itself and the pan. Just enough to buffer and lube it up, so to speak, in lieu of oil. So it doesn't start to heat up and it'll start to smell good. And as we're talking about the onion cooking, I want to go down here and also discuss what I have written here in the original recipe. Actually, I, I, I guess I probably miscategorized the order of things, if you will. I say first to cook the onion and the celery. And the celery, too, is one of those items that, well, you know, it's easy to chop on its own. But I also wanted to mention and go back to simplicity. You know, we live in an electri electrified world, but I also like to have on hand at times Tupperware. It doesn't break, so that's nice. But in lieu of Tupperware, I also want to have available for you folks some non-electrical options. This is a hand crank food processor. And surprisingly, it's very, very effective. I encourage you guys, if you're so inclined, to you pick one up for yourself. So if you don't feel like chopping, or if you have kids in the kitchen, or whatever your mood may be, and just want to maybe work a little harder for your dinner. It's remarkably quick and effective. Let's put it in here in a little bowl. It has little rubberized feet so it doesn't move around. It's kind of, I really need to put this down. Unfortunately, you can't see it. But just with a couple turns, this is difficult because of the slippery tablecloth. I wanted to do five turns. And you already had a rough chop like that. It's so easy. And here's my favorite part. Clean up. You know, those of you, those of us who have food processors at home, they're tricky. They have a lot of crevices, they have the food chute, there's a lot of bits and pieces, and this is like a nightmare to clean. I don't want myself to think at the end of the day, oh, I could have spent more time in the kitchen. No. My goal is to spend as little time in the kitchen and get good, nutritious food as possible. So there you have it. So there it goes into the pot as well, just to sort of water so tennis we've already spoken about. And then this does a really quick rinse. I can't demonstrate for you here, but it's really quick. And this also has an adapter to, to make your own salad dressings as well. It has a different little cap. So this, this is a hand crank food processor.
processor. This one in particular is from Tupperware. I don't represent Tupperware, but I use a lot of Tupperware and have used a lot of Tupperware in my kitchen for 10 years. And I would speak highly of it if any of you so choose or are looking for something to invest in. This is a good piece of equipment. Like I say also, it's really good kid safe too, elder safe. It's just a great product to have. Is it very angry? You know, that's an excellent question. I, one thing about having it free is true, but what, I, what I'm doing in there, what did they touch it for? Perhaps 10 seconds. It wasn't heated. It's not an acid. So I believe that my safety level is, it passes my safety test, so to speak. If I were going out, I'm certain a lot of the products now that you would find available would have that focus. Actually, I believe this is the type of equipment that they make the airline windshields out of. And the name escapes me at the moment, so it's pretty safe, generally speaking. So I see here, our onions are starting to get that little translucent color. Our celery is on its way to cooking. And then what else do we need to add here? I say, on um, my second line, add remaining liquid and items. But really what we want to do is I talk about water sauteing that broccoli. So what I'm going to do is just mix it up. We just want to make certain this broccoli gets cooked. Yes? You say till almost tender. What, what do you mean by almost tender? If we only knew, if we only knew, why do I use those words? You know, that's a great point. Well, I can tell because I've done it countless times. I have no idea. But when you, the more you work with food, the more you'll be able to gauge. You'll begin to notice that it's not hard, and this little onion part will start to become from opaque to translucent, and the same will happen with the celery. But guess what, folks? That's why. You can make burping mistakes with this recipe and it just won't matter because we're going to blend it up. It might taste a little bit, uh, it might take a little longer to blend up, but that won't be an issue with this recipe. So there you go, and I'm going to go ahead and add this uh, chopped broccoli. And yes, this broccoli would have worked well in that hand crate processor too. I just had a high value. And I also mentioned in there to include, include with the broccoli those wonderful stalks. When I was growing up, no one told me I could eat the straws and broccoli. Did anybody know that you can? Yes. I know, it's like my favorite part. So yes, and I include that peel because the peels are a rich source of nutrients that often get chopped out of the food and that's just, we shouldn't have that happening. So it's really making the most economically out of your veggie too. And even though I say a bunch, I don't mean just literally one stalk. We need about six cups of this broccoli for the dish. So here we go. I'm just going to go ahead and just quickly toss this a bit so it gets some high gain before I add any more water. I really want this to come up to temperature a bit. So there we have it. It's all cooking quick. I wonder how many minutes, I mean, at home I would have gassy and it would really boost up the temperature and be cooking much quicker than it is on this little electric um, one, one stove. It's just not as high of heat as I'd like and as quick. But these dishes today that I'm presenting for you are designed also for you to be in and out of the kitchen in 10 minutes or less, essentially. This is the dish where you get in there and say, or what happens when you come home <gasps> from work or a long day and it's just like, oh, uh, I don't think I can handle cooking. I just don't think I can. Well, perhaps consider this dish, right? It's something you do quick and easy, and it's better than anything on the shelf. Because what scares me about the stuff on the shelf is that, well, it's been cooked to death, and then one of three things is going to happen with any of your processed foods. It's either not going to have any flavor because they removed all the fat, all the salt, or all the sugar. It's going to be one of those three things. Whenever I'm desperate, I'm in the grocery store, and I look at those vegan soups on the aisle, and say, oh, that looks good. So I might try it out, and then I get home, and it's like, such a disappointment. Just give me the fresh food, please. So that's what I hope to encourage you to try out at home. So this is coming up to temp pretty well. And while that's coming up to temp, then what I want to do is add something called a Bragg's liquid amino. Are you guys familiar with your pretty educated group here? Anyone heard of this product? Few of you have. And for those of you who haven't, go get it. And once again, I don't represent this company, but they do great work, health work. And this is an unfermented product. And it's, it's used similar to as some are familiar with fermented soy sauce. It's good stuff. And this will flavor your savory <laughs> dishes unlike a traditional sea salt will. So I use it a lot in the sauces I prepare at home just because it has a good flavor. And so what I'm going to do here is go ahead. Well, how, many, how much do I say put in there? Two tablespoons? No, I'm not going to measure it because I don't measure stuff at home. Who in their home cook, unless you're cooking some sort of bakery 
item that needs a chemical reaction and therefore requires specific measuring amounts, I simply eyeball it and I feel it and I taste it. I usually err on less and then uh, you can always add more as they say, but it's hard to take it out. So I had a good dose there of liquid aminos and of course you can always add it later if that's not sufficient. And then over here, I see garlic granules and granulated dried onion. Once again, I wanted to give you folks items that would be readily available in your own kitchen. Yes, you can use fresh garlic. Yes, you can avoid using the onion powder or the um, garlic powder. Yes, you can put in some other flavor. If that's what suits you, please do so. It's just these are readily available ingredients that are concentrated in flavor of look. Um, detract from the main dish. So I've already pre-measured the items of the garlic powder or garlic granules actually it's not it's a, I find the garlic powder can be bitter so I typically will not use garlic powder and I also wanted to add for you folks because I also wanted to demonstrate what a little bit of cashew can do for a dish. This as the recipe is written and as I have samples prepared for you is a fat-free dish. And if you're in a meal plan approach where that's going to do your body good, then yummy, yummy, it's great that way. But if you want something a little richer without adding dairy to your product or without adding the oil, I have here, I think it's about two measured tablespoons, maybe one and a half measured tablespoons of a raw cashew. The cashew in the mirror, it's remarkable. I'm always amazed at the thickening powers cashew has in any sort of cook preparation. So I'm just going to add this so you can demonstrate or maybe your pal might find this pleasing over the fat-free version. See, I'm just going to raise it up. There's just, just a few little pieces and we'll get to see what they can do for this soup. It's amazing. One word I also wanted to add is what happens if you make the soup at home and it's like water? What happens if it's not thick enough? Well, you can always add some starch. You can add a bit of cornstarch uh, diluted in a bit of water and add it to your hot food and that will create a thickening property that will be well received if that's what you're looking for. Corn starch, arrowroot starch, potato starch. I typically would avoid wheat. That would give it a different kind of thickening that would not be palatable necessarily for a soup preparation such as this. So I'm going on talking and talking, but I also want to encourage you if you folks have any questions while I'm talking, please raise your hand. I'll do the best to answer that. So with that said, oh, it's cooking away nicely. Now, I also say four cups of water purified or veggie broth. I'm one of those folks, I don't know what it is, I think I have everything food wise in my kitchen possible. And yet, if it comes to veggie broth, I never have it. I might have it, but I use it up as soon as I either make it or have to purchase it special wise. And I'm, I usually cook my, my vegetables in such a way that I use the cooking liquid from the vegetable preparation. So I never have a need to purchase the veggie broth itself, but I would encourage you to do the same at home and not, not rely on those over-salted bombs on the shelf that are called veggie broth. And, and I encourage you to make your own at home. By the way, you cook your vegetables. Um, it's easy enough to do. Or if you're like me, one thing I also add, and I didn't mention this specifically, is I also like to use a dried mushroom powder. This one's from Pistol River up in Oregon. It's called Mushroom Ultimate. So it's already a dried mushroom in a powder form. Once again, it adds another layer of flavor that's going to be very well received, hopefully, on your palate. Then I enjoy using it in a lot of my dishes to help carry flavor. So even though I say here, four cups of water purified, which I'm putting in our, putting in our pot right now, or veggie broth, we're going to add a little bit of this mushroom seasoning to sort of compensate for the lack of not having a uh, veggie broth itself. So I'm going to add about a teaspoon or so. This is good stuff. They sell it often in the produce section, even though it's a dried product. Or you can also make your own dried mushroom powder at home and, you know, by just picking up your dried mushroom at the market and puree or putting it in a blender or a spice grinder and having it available. It, uh, it'll add that thickening quality and also flavor quality that you might find enjoyable. So there we have it. And there it's going to be for a bit because it's a lot of water for this little, little stove top. So while that's coming up to temperature, I'm going to take us along to, oops, pardon me, my mic just, I pulled it up. So I'm going to take us along to the moose in a minute. I'm going to, yes. Where did, uh, what store did you get the mushroom powder at? This is actually, I live up in Sonoma County 
And I shop frequently at, they have a wonderful new Bailey's there. It's all, you know, eco-friendly. It's just lovely. So this one I know is readily available at Bailey's. I believe it's available at some of Dallas's smaller markets, Oliver's Market. It may be available through one of the major outlets. But it also has a website called PistolRiverMushrooms.com. And so you can just go ahead and look at it. They also have different flavors of the seasoning. Very tasty. So I want to go to dessert now. Ah, luscious dessert. I also want to talk about, oh dear, well, what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about dessert and also what am I using for dessert. I am with a chocoholic, but he still will like Kara. Now Kara, I have a wonderful information sheet. You know, chocolate's being in batch, right? Okay, right, here it is. But there's some nutritional differences that might make you stand back and take into account about why are you choosing chocolate over carob. Carob is one of those wonderfully naturally sweet alkalinizing food products. It's also a rich source of micronutrients. So it's a good choice to start incorporating. I, this is Bob's Red Mill toasted carob powder. Also available is a raw carob powder if you prefer, and it works a lot like chocolate powder will, yet it's naturally sweet, so you're not going to uh, require as much sweetener in your dishes. So, one thing I want to make for you is this chocolate mousse. Yes, you could substitute cocoa if that's what you prefer. So how do we make this? And, and one thing I really enjoy about this, once again, it's economical, it's quick, and it's very tasty, and it will last a couple days if it can last. So what I have here for you are five to six bananas. I just squished these up this morning. They've started to oxidize a bit. And that's a, I just want to also mention about oxidation. This is fresh food. And when we use, you know, foods, we talk about oxidative stress or what is oxidation within our body. Fresh foods can help correct that. And I think what we, this is like a visible sign once it starts to jump around. It won't matter in this dish because the carob will mask the color change in it. But it's also good to remember that when you're taking in any product, that uh, what is it doing to your body? What's its purpose in your body? One thing that you can rely on with fresh food is that it's high in antioxidants. And that's good. And as they sit over time, though, you realize that those antioxidants run out, run out the door, so to speak. So if you're buying food at the grocery store, just make certain, try to focus on fresh food. It's just one of those things. You realize if you're working with fresh food, how prone to, uh, I guess, degradation it can be, and uh, really what's its purpose in our bodies then any longer. It's just, you know, something to consider. So I've just squished up that banana. It's already here in this container. And then what else do I add? Applesauce. Oh, this is apple season. Oh, my favorite. I make like these huge vats of apples. This is actually a North Coast organic applesauce. No added sugar, just the apples. Now, for those who care to know applesauce, how do you make it? It's so easy. It's so delightful to make. You can make raw applesauce. You take your apple, chop it up a bit, put it in a blender, and a little bit of water, a little bit of lemon juice. Blend it. That's it. You can eat it right then on the spot. Or if you prefer, dump it from your blender into a sauce pot, cook for a little bit. There you have your own homemade applesauce. The best stuff in the world. I'm terribly serious. It's just Wonderful, and you know, a lot of times now you can get those apples free. People have them available because they don't want to fuss with those little tiny apples they have in their yard. Those are great for making your own homemade applesauce, and you don't have to peel them. You want to maintain that peel for the extra nutrition properties that it maintains. Yes? Um, once you're cooking applesauce, will that make it keep longer? Or when you say cook, it make it keep longer. You know, that's a good question. It will because it's not going to be prone to you know, the oxidative process. But what I also will do is I cook it and then I will also um, freeze it. I, I, I know you can can it, but I'm more of a freeze person because the canning process takes so long. And in this part of the country with our, you know, we don't live in a food desert as they say, so it's going to be readily available for me. So I just, it, it never lasts long enough in my home to ever have it go bad with it. If that it makes any sense, I just never, I've never had it on lined up. So I picked up this at the store just to show it's out there. You want to look at the ingredients. What does it say here? Fresh, whole, certified organic apples, water, 
a little bit of organic berry puree, and a little bit of vitamin C there to help it turn. Now my hands are, are wet, or are moist from the cooking, and what you can do, if you ever, of course, have a, a jar that won't open, you can either use the rubber band around the seal, and that'll help get it, or you can take the, a butter knife and usually pop this lid. But my hands are still too moist to do that. Can I have a volunteer come up and open up this jar of applesauce for me? Anyone want to go up here? Thank you. Be careful of that. Pardon? It's too fat. I don't advise against tipping it on the um, pavement. Some people will do that. But I say it's too risky. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. So then we got that. Wonderful. So this is, a, how much is this one? This is 24 ounces. So I'm calling for here in this recipe a cup and a half. A cup and a half is essentially 12 ounces. As uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, saying a pint, a pound, the world around. So you're saying 16 ounces equals a pound, generally speaking, equals a pint. So I'm just going to eyeball it. Why not? I don't need, I don't want to dirty a measure and cup, no need for that. So I'm just going to eyeball it. I think we should be just about there based on how much is remaining here in this container. Now for the wonderful part, the carrot part. And I've already pre-measured that for you because that can be a little tricky sometimes. You don't want too much carrot and it'll be chalky otherwise. But it, it's really dependent upon what the person, um, the taster really prefers. So there you have your carrot I measured out. And then for the demos, you'll see there's a bit of mint in there. Carob and mint are like married. They go together so well. A little mint goes a long way. And it's a good carbative, right? It helps your digestion. It helps you at the end of the day. So I made this mousse approximately 24 hours ago. I took it out this morning. It was solid. It does thicken upon refrigeration. You'll see here it's kind of kind of squishy. But you, I, although I did have some refrigeration issues earlier today. I was able to get things refrigerated as cool, keep it cool as possible. So I don't know what the state is right now. You want to check one of those? And this, I just would like to know. What happened to the carrot mousse? Just open it up and see. Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it thin? So it did have an, uh, it has cooled off. It's a plant based food. I'm not concerned about health issues with it. But upon refrigeration this morning, it was like solid mass of goodness. So here we go. We've got it all measured here, nice and kind of sloppy, but good. And then I'm just going to throw in some vanilla. You know, I have a buddy of mine, bless her heart. She's one of my favorite ladies. She's, Oh, in her late 80s, and she won this cookie contest, a Mrs. Fields cookie contest. And she's like an infamous, not just an infamous, but she's a well-known lady for her baking talents. And I said, okay, what makes your cookies so good? And so she shares with me the secret. She makes her own vanilla. Well, how do you make your own vanilla? You take your vanilla bead, yes, and you put it, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to give any bad info, but it's true. She puts it in some vodka. She doesn't drink the vodka, but she puts the vanilla bean in there. And so it's a really pure product that she uses. And you know, it's pretty good she shared it with me. This one is a pure vanilla extract, which contains no corn syrup. I wouldn't think you would want your vanilla extract to ever contain corn syrup. So just take a look and see what you're getting at the store. Um, who knows what they're trying to sell us? It's scary. Okay, so there we have it. I have the bit of vanilla, I'm just going to make this one vanilla since I already have a mint one prepared for you folks. And then here's another option here. Not all of us have equipment or care to have all this equipment in our homes. I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. And another option is something, what did I say? Well, I guess I was going to make this in a blender. I'll just use a blender. Now I have one of the best blenders in the whole world. And I know Vitamix is here. And I have a Blumtech blender. It's awesome. I mean, it's just awesome. I can do anything with it. And yeah, you know not everyone is blessed enough to have a Blumtech. And so I chose to bring oh, this poor soul's little blender. I don't know. Is this 35-year-old blender? But it's in beautiful shape. Someone must have never loved it enough to really damage it. But here I'm going to try using it for you folks. And let's see how it does. Because I do say you can use a blender here. Or you could use a stick blender, like this guy. You know, I'm going to use the stick blender over there for the soup. And now, uh-oh. <laughs> I got a 
I got a cord wrapped in here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for thinking of that. I don't know whether I can even. Uh, it is weird. I guess. I don't know what I was thinking when I. I don't know how it got in there. So. Well, I know that's what I thought too, and yet. Help with rinsing. 
I'll be able to use thank you. So there you have it. Wasn't that easy? I mean, considering time, I thought that was pretty quick. So once again, you can eat that soup chill or warm. Now, you had a potato bag. You tell me you were leftovers. That was very wise, actually, because I made have leftovers. Who knows? So the question Bev raised earlier is, on Wednesday night, I served something called a creme carob. She asked, was this dish the same? No, I wanted to give you this dish today because it doesn't require any cooking. The mousse did not require any cooking. The one that I prepared last Wednesday that Beth was referring to, actually, yes, contained a lot of this carob stuff. Also contained, uh, what starch did I use? Hmm, I can't recall at the moment. Oh, cornstarch? And I actually used some coconut water and some dried dates I had soaked. Oh, wow. And I brought that up to a cooking point after I blended my date and made it more like a traditional pudding, if you will, like a chocolate pudding only in a carrot form. So that was what I served the folks on Wednesday night dinner. This is just something easy. I like it because you don't have to turn on a burner for it. So with that said, let's go along back up to bean and kale saute. Beans and greens, as one of my buddies used to say, what are you eating? Beans and greens, why not? But uh, sometimes beans and greens just, it just may not sound like the most appetizing way. But I want to hopefully change your opinion on that. So what are we talking about here? Talking about onion chopped again. Now, what did I do for your onion this time? I think I already had it pre-chopped, so when I get the pot back, I'll put that in there. And that's a white beans. Oh, this is the part you might want to listen up for. I don't have them here today in front of you, but I also do a lot of crock pot or slow cooking. And this is where I also use a lot of my beans. All my beans, I you know, just buy dried already in the state. I place them in the slow cooker with water and an herb of my choosing. And this particular one, I use some thyme. So these are just a name, or white northern bean with some herb and water. The one thing I like about the crock pot beans is you don't, you're not stuck in the kitchen. It's safe, it's economical. And you walk away from it. And then you come back and it's like, oh, I've got all these beans. And they're so tasty and good and they make me happy. And they're not gassy. Yes, Greta. So you do not have to soak beforehand? No. Because they're so good. It's a slow cooking. It's a wonderful way of approaching. I also enjoy the thought of knowing that it's um, a non-reactive metal. I don't know, it's just my gut feeling. I, it's even stainless steel is a metal, and I prefer not to use metal. I don't know, it's just one of my ways of thinking on it. So it's a low, slow way of cooking, and typically these are well digested, meaning they don't really give you gas afterwards for most people. Also what you can do, I recommend it because it's so economical, you're not, you're not even risking the whole BPA contamination with purchasing them in a can, but you can also place them in either a, in a freezer container, or unfortunately, like I like to do sometimes just for space conservation, is place them in a bag like this, and then put them in your freezer. Yay! Ready to eat beans, just pull them out of your freezer, ready to use in any dish of your preference, even chili, right? So that's my little talk on beans. Just throw them in the pot, get a crock pot if you don't have one, you pick them up used, and they're readily easy, safe appliances to use. So I have, do, yes? How long do you cook the beans in the crock pot? Oh, I was hoping this question would not come up. I'm not really sure. I only say because, oh, but I have something for those pantry saver people out there, and I know you're out there. I won't name names, but some people like to save food. And they like to save food because it's dry and because it's pretty, sh I'm getting to your answer. And it's shelf stable. It's like, it smells good, it looks good. I'm gonna go ahead and eat it. Well, fine. But please don't do it with beans. And let me tell you why. If you don't have fresh dried beans, they're never going to cook. Meaning you'll keep, you'll like look at them, it's like they're still hard and you'll go back a while, it's like they're still hard. So please folks, yes, you can you know, purchase your beans, but just kind of make a general notation of how old they are when you purchase them, because you may find you get a, thank you so much, you may find yourself with a batch of beans that just is not, it's just not cooking properly, and it could be because they're old, they're like five years old. Even though I rotate my stuff frequently in my kitchen, I found a bag of beans that should have been used last October. Yes, nutritionally they were fine, 
But I'm going to tell you, my time was not worth it, even, even considering what will these cook or not. So out they went. So to answer your question, how long do they cook? Well, crock pots or slow cookers are kind of, oh, they're all unique creations, manufactured. So you have some of your older crock pots, perhaps from the 70s or 80s. They seem to be at a higher temperature point. They also do not have uh, temperature variation settings as your newer crock pots do. And some newer crock pots actually have, I think, a temperature setting, a slow cooker. So that's why I'm saying, and some run hotter and some run cooler. It's they're really temperamental. And so I wish I could give you a guideline. Well, safe one thing for me, and this is also I um, also conduct some other classes, especially one dealing with. Uh, being in breakfast, and that would be waking up to a nice, warm breakfast on a cold winter day. That a breakfast that you is ready and willing, you know, ready for you to eat from your crock pot. So to answer your question again, in another form is you put your beans in before you go to bed at night, and then in the morning they should be done. Or you know, if you feel safe about it, if you leave for the day and then come home, they should be done. So generally eight hours. So you double the water, just like normal. Once again, I don't measure. And it depends on really what I want the bean to do. I simply would preferably prefer maybe an inch and a half of water over the beans. And then bay leaf or thyme or any dried herb of your choice. Uh, avoid using any salted product to your dried bean. Once again, that will toughen it up and it won't cook properly. Yeah. Would it be possible to ever, I've never heard anyone do it, but steamed beans? I'm sorry about steam what? Steamed dried beans, would that work at all these things? Only if they were sprouted. So I still think you'd have to have an enzyme conversion. I, there's a whatever you do is just avoid eating raw kidney oh. without dry kidney beans. <laughs> Don't do it. It could kill you. <laughs> All right. So wait a second. So I'm talking chopped onions. We're gonna do our water sauteing real quickly here. So in the pot, the onions go. Onions. Why onions? Affordable, tasty, they add a flavor to this dish um, you, you'll enjoy, as well as they have a very important component that's a, a, a cancer fighting component. And that's good, right? I mean, something to consider. And in the name of the cancer fighting component, it's not on the tip of my tongue at the moment, but it's good stuff. So I've got my water bubbling away and my onions are simmering. I'm just going to go ahead because. I want, does anyone have the time by chance? How am I doing it? 415. 415. 415. Oh dear. I'm going to really uh, speed it up for you folks. So there goes my beans. And then what about herbs? Oh, you know, this is just a dry blend. Find one you like. It's a mixture of oregano, marjoram, uh, thyme, all your Mediterranean herbs. And also what I find, I'm not doing it in front of you, but if I were home, I'd be doing pinching my herbs and going like this into my pot. What that does is release the essential oil. Just make sure, and also your herbs should not last on your cabinet for too long. Many, meaning really a 12 months to 18 months, depending. And I also prefer to buy a whole herb, grow a whole herb, or use a seed. Fennel seed will work really well with this dish as well. So I got my herbs and kale. Seriously, I don't think I did. So it's readily available. You can even buy it clean and chop. This is what I did. Not because I was lazy, but I was pressed for time. I'm glad it was available for us. So I also mentioned chard or dandelion. Just make certain you get this leafy green in your diet. Make certain you get a dark leafy green in your diet, please. The other recipe of the broccoli soup mentioned crunchy, but today we're focusing on, or on this particular recipe on leafy. Uh, veggie uh, greens. So here we go. I'm not going to use the whole bag. It's my pot at the moment and the time component. Also now, this is a, another issue I use or another item I use frequently in my cooking at home and that's a fresh lemon or lime. You're just not going to beat it for its nutritional value and its flavor component. When you consider that it's a natural acid, you can also, as I do, use the yellow peel rich in bioflavonoids, high in antioxidants, and we live in California. And 
I grew up not having lemons, and now I eat them all the time, and they're just wonderfully, uh, I just love them. So, and they add a brightness to a dish. So what, what I discovered, because I use so many lemons, is like, oh, what do I do to squeeze out all this lemon juice? I'm not like a um, power man, you know, squeezing with one hand all the time. And I don't really like wooden reamers. Those always have the pointy edge, and sometimes they poke through on the lemon, and then they hit your hand. It's like, ouch! That hurt, and uh, I thought, and then they make those gadgets. I'm not much of a gadget person. I really am not, but they do make gadgets that will do the job for you. But I like to have double duty stuff. So I have my favorite. I have a lot of these. Wooden spoons, yes. It's a well used and one wooden spoon, but guess what? It typically fits perfectly with a lemon. And it's like the best lemon juicer ever. See how easy that is? And it's just phenomenal. So there you have it. Um, a little sloppy with that, but there you go. That's your own little homemade lemon juicer. I enjoy using it at home. Now, if I were home, I would also use that lemon peel, but we're here and I'm not going to use it for you. So there you have it. So I've added my lemon juice. I just need to add a little bit of water. Hmm. I guess I'm out of water. I guess I won't. Hopefully that lemon juice will do the job. A squirt or two of rags. Once again, just for a little bit of uh, seasoning flavor. And fresh garlic. I also want to talk quickly about garlic. Of course, its properties are well known. I, I prefer to press my own garlic fresh at home. I don't enjoy using those that are already bottled and fresh. They just don't even taste as good. So there you have it. And I have um, samples for you to eat over there. I'm just going to let this continue to simmer for just a little bit until the kale's wilted. Once again, this is one of those dishes, surprisingly, it goes well either hot or cold. If it's, you know, a hot summer day, it goes well very, uh, you can just enjoy it at, at a chill temperature, and it's delightful. Now, for the end, end is near. Zesty booster straight sprinkles. What in the world? You know, it's like the shaky stuff you can get at the store. You can buy it or you can make it. I want to emphasize making this stuff at home. Number one is the quality of ingredients used. You just can't you typically buy something that is, that is a good of quality at, um, from the store that then you can make it better at home. So what I start off with is nutritional yeast, but I'm not using nutritional yeast because I was surprisingly out of it. But really what I want you to do with, as with all the other three recipes I've given you today, these are guidelines, these are not set in stones. I just want, them, want you to use them and be inspired. So what I have is a whole bag, I'm not gonna go in order here, I'm just gonna go in order that I pick this up. I have a bit of almond, I enjoy almond and I enjoy the taste. Uh, it just adds a nice crunchiness flavor, and it's a neutral enough flavor when I had it available. Now, what else did I measure in this bag? I have, oh, this is nice. This is actually something called Torula yeast that has a bit of smoke, hickory smoke flavor. That's it. That's all it is. So it adds a nice uh, savory flavor. If you prefer to make a sprinkle of what you want to use on your breakfast cereal, as my husband does in the morning, you would want to omit the hickory, hickory uh, yeast from this recipe. But I had it available and it's good to use. And then chia seed. Chia is awesome. It looks like ground black pepper the first time I saw it. I was like, what is that? And it's just, it's just a little tiny, tiny powerhouse of a seed. And it's, of course, known for its omega-3 fatty acid profiles. Good stuff for you. It's always those tiny seeds that are just a life force of, of goodness. And then I also have two tablespoons of sesame seed here. Now, the sesame seed is a good source of calcium, surprisingly. It's just one of those foods, too, you want to think so you can try and get into your diet, if at all possible. Ah, and then seaweed. This one can be hard. I don't know. This seaweed doesn't come naturally to me, so I really try hard to get into my diet. And so this is the nori sheet. I'm just going to, uh, you know, tear it up a little bit. Hopefully it'll blend up in there. It's good for its um, cleansing properties and detoxifying properties. And then I also have here some flax. Flax seed, of course, is rich in lignans. And it's also a powerhouse of a cancer-fighting agent, and as well as aid in digestion. Helps regulate bowel movements, 
and really, it really is important. I'm sorry, I don't want us all to giggle, but digestion is just key to your overall immune health. And then, it's like my favorite seed of the month, or the year, is hemp seed. It looks like a sesame seed with some green on it. And the good thing about the, um, as I have here in my notes, it has all essential amino acids, the hemp seed does, so that's good stuff to use. So there you have it, more or less. And you can purchase the hemp seed. I know Manitoba Harvest has a has an outfit here, I think, this weekend. But I, this is also just Bob's Red Mill, whole hemp seed that I use. And I want to talk about omega threes and sixes quickly. It's good for your overall mental health, good for your skin. Uh, once again, I know someone who I helped work through having some skin issues. And really what it came down to was a lack of omega-3 fatty acids in their diet. And they were just shocked at including them, starting to include them in, in their diet, and they were alleviated from their symptoms and problems. So just keep that in mind if you're having skin issues, even mental health issues, uh, the omega-3s can really help. So I'm also, here again, I'm using like a 20-year-old uh, spice blender here. And some of that stuff really worked well, except hmm, I think I've clogged up with seeds, some of the little stuff in here. So I'm just going to wrap up our talk here because we have the samples. But the reason I'm using the spice blender here for our sprinkle mix, and I have samples to hand out. You can either use those on a uh, pasta or rice or anything that suits you. One thing, though, I did, I made a rookie's mistake yesterday, and I don't want you to make that rookie mistake. Yes, I have that beloved blender blender, yet what happened is I pressed the button, I walked away because I'm doing other things. And I pressed it again, I almost had nut butter on my hand. So you gotta be careful not to over blend it. That's why a, um, a little device such as I have here, or a coffee blender is better suited. You don't want it too fine, and I think I, for my own personal taste, I, I ground it too fine. So with that said, you can also put this on your salad. It's a good way to incorporate those foods for you. So I'm finished with today's presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Well, what I do is currently I'm in the process of developing a book, and if you have any personal questions, please feel free to reference my email address down below, and I'll be happy to email you information to help you out. So I invite you're welcome. I invite you now all to taste and enjoy the. Um, dishes that we prepare here today. Just keep in mind that this demo also was at 2.30 in the morning, and so I had some logistical issues with getting the food to you or keeping it at the temperature that I would prefer. So it may not be exactly what you think you want, but I want you to be inspired to perhaps use it as a base, especially with the evening kale saute. Sometimes what I will do at home is also add a kalamala olive for some saltiness, natural, and I can also enjoy the color of a roasted red bell pepper. It has a beautiful red color and flavor. Or you can also add a little bit of mustard to this kale saute, and that, that helps make a little bit of a thicker sauce that I find um, tasty and nice. So I hope you're inspired, and as we're getting out the samples, if anyone else has any other questions, I'll be happy to answer that. Otherwise, I guess, oh, don't forget, the blender's available, and so is the stick, my stick blender, wherever that is, if anyone wants to take that home, if they can. Thank you. Thank you.